Dear students, this lecture number five is going to be on project portfolio management. And uh, the idea really in this lecture is to help us with studying the uh, project portfolio material, the written material and the eight project portfolio management videos. But uh, I want to remind you that as project portfolio management is connected to the management of the firm, management of the firm and its projects. So we have also um, chapters five and seven in our uh, textbook and uh, the corresponding videos, which are uh, connected also to this theme about managing projects, organizing projects and organizing the firm and its projects. Uh, then we have uh, these few uh, self-study lesson exercises uh, and uh, the project portfolio management uh, group assignment which this uh, lecture also prepares us for. Okay, let's uh, look about uh, the content of this lecture. So, here are the rubrics. Uh, first, uh, project portfolio management. Uh, and the abbreviation that we use is PPM. Uh, the three-letter uh, acronym for uh, that concept. And uh, we are going to discuss about the definition of project portfolio and project portfolio management. And uh, I would argue that uh, when we are discussing about what that actually is, what project portfolio management is, we can have a, gr a good understanding uh, of the actual uh, management approaches that are uh, involved in project portfolio management. Uh, one important thing uh, to mention to you or make a notion is that we will start getting acquaint uh, acquainted with the project portfolio management by uh, looking at the firm's internal development projects. So they may be investment projects, in investments uh, to a new production facility. Uh, they uh, may be, uh, let's say, investments uh, to an organizational change, uh, but also innovation projects like uh, product, new product development and, and other kinds of uh, uh, internal projects. And uh, uh, this particular setting uh, of uh, looking at the in-house projects, in-house development projects, uh, it allows us to think about uh, even uh, rather radical management actions uh, that uh, might be connected to project portfolio management. For example, killing projects and, uh, and so forth. And uh, actually I want that we have here a kind of a free uh, feeling of a freedom to do that those kinds of actions. So if we would have a, a external customer delivery projects and uh, we would have uh, some contractual constraints, uh, we cannot that easily uh, put the project on hold or uh, reduce resources on that specific project or, or or kill even not kill that project because then we would be uh, uh, let's say. Uh, uh, responsible for paying uh, the uh, delay penalties or, or, or something for the customer. So uh, these management practices that we are going to learn in this lecture, definitely they apply also, also to any kinds of projects, also uh, external customer delivery projects. But uh, I would say that after that we have been rehearsed or practiced project portfolio management by thinking about uh, the in-house uh, development projects that we can uh, easily or more freely kind of adjust uh, the way we want, we can then uh, 
uh, transfer those ideas, for example, to external delivery projects and, uh, for example, start thinking about whether we would like even to bid a certain project to a customer or whether we would like to invest to that kind of a customer delivery or, or, or so. So uh, let's keep our uh, minds open and thinking about uh, projects that we can uh, manage rather freely uh, in, in, in many ways. Okay, uh, the approach in project portfolio management is uh, really very much decision focused. So it's about kind of a decision analysis and decision making. And uh, we have analyze, uh, analysis methods, we have visualization methods, and we make portfolio decisions in the end. And uh, the decisions uh, really uh, apply to whole portfolio. And the reasoning is about the collection of the projects, not specifically on uh, single projects that would be separated and, and, and their, uh, let's say, goodness would be thought uh, as a separate thing. Uh, we look at the collection of projects and as projects are in some way uh, connected to each others, uh, uh, we must balance between certain projects. Not all uh, projects can be similar kinds of projects, not all projects can be uh, high profit and high risk projects, but there must be also other kinds of projects. So we make decisions that apply to the portfolio as a whole, but of course those decisions, they affect uh, to, uh, single projects as well. Uh, then uh, we are going to talk about the three project portfolio management objectives, maximizing the value of the portfolio, uh, link to strategy, and balance in the portfolio. Let's look at those uh, objectives and also the methods that are uh, connected to those uh, objectives. Then um, uh, we are going to talk about the formal process. I'm going to explain what the formal process means, but that is a kind of a systematic way of uh, selecting the projects to the portfolio or prioritizing the projects. But we are also going to look at other ways to select projects to the portfolio and we are going to uh, uh, address uh, such concepts as pet projects and under, under the table projects, which are kind of uh, hidden from uh, the uh, upper level management. Okay, uh, then uh, ideas. Project ideas, uh, very early, uh, let's say, fuzzy uh, possibilities uh, to engage into certain kind of a project and start investing to a certain project idea. We are talking uh, about that uh, at the latter part of our uh, lecture, even though that would be actually the idea, ideas or ideation part would be the uh, maybe the first step uh, of uh, starting uh, uh, designing uh, the portfolio, the collection of projects uh, and also uh, early project ideas can be considered as projects uh, of their own. Okay, then uh, we are talking about on hold projects. Uh, we actually make decisions where we uh, put uh, projects maybe on hold for a while or we are not sure whether we are ready to make the decision to continue. And uh, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, how to uh, treat them uh, in the actual uh, management uh, and uh, decision making uh, entity. And then uh, the last thing, uh, projects as options. When we engage into certain projects and uh, when there is a lot of uncertainty, we kind of buy an option depending on what kind of a future there will be, what uh, uh, is going to the future that will turn out uh, in the future, whether the option, whether the development but that we do in the, the actual project is uh, 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 usable or beneficial or not, but we still bought that option that depending on what the future uh, 
state is so so it can be that it was worthwhile or it was worthwhile to buy the option uh, in uh, in case in a way okay uh, hey uh, in this picture we have these same items uh, that uh, we went through now in this uh, flipboard uh, and we have a little bit more detailed uh, explanation uh, 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 more ex uh, uh, um, in more detail explained uh, bullets under these uh, main uh, rubrics. So uh, I think I explained uh, quite a lot about each of these uh, items but you can then look at this uh, uh, picture or this slide uh, uh, maybe even later on if you, you like and if you want to digest about what the actual contents of each of these uh, main rubrics are. Okay, now uh, let's talk next about project portfolio, what that is, and project portfolio management, what that is. Okay, now in this picture we have uh, these uh, definitions and we even have a kind of a multiple definitions about project portfolio management. Uh, first, um, let's take a look what project portfolio is. There is uh, the definition in the first bullet there. Uh, it is a collection of projects that are carried out in the same company or alternatively in the same organizational unit. There is an organizational entity and it's all projects are actually, uh, they form the, the, the collection, they form the portfolio. Well, uh, then with the same strategic objectives. And this refers to the fact that because they are in the same company, uh, they are under the same, same strategic umbrella of the company. And of course, uh, because they are in the same company, they, the projects use same resources or actually uh, the host, hosting company or host company's uh, resource pool uh, is available for uh, these all projects. Okay, that was definition of project portfolio. Now let's look at the second bullet where we define project portfolio management in, in a certain way. And uh, that definition uh, says that uh, it is uh, uh, the art and science of applying a set of knowledge, skills, tools and techniques to a collection of projects in order to meet or exceed the needs and expectations of an organization's strategy. And there is now uh, a more detailed definition, rather investment strategy. Now we must uh, understand that uh, the investment here refers to a rather broad, uh, uh, let's say, concept. We may even invest in a customer delivery projects a project if, if, if you want to, we want to think that about an investment, whether that is worthwhile to start delivering and start uh, kind of a, uh, earning profit. Uh, but rather, because we are not uh, thinking so much now in this lecture about the external delivery projects, we are t thinking about the internal in-house development projects, we invest in new product development or we invest in organizational change or new production system or, 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 or something uh, else. And uh, this investment uh, word uh, uh, underlines uh, the decision analysis uh, and decision making uh, uh, orientation of project portfolio management. When we invest, for example, uh, in uh, in, in, in stocks, for example, we buy uh, 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 in, in stock exchange, we buy uh, cert certain companies uh, st uh, stock show uh, that is an investment and we have a portfolio of different kinds of stocks and so on. Okay, now the second 
definition about project portfolio management that uh, kind of complements uh, the first one uh, by telling about the decision-making approach. So it is about prioritization, about review, realignment and reprioritization. And then we underline that it is uh, uh, in the, the emphasis is in the st uh, strategic content of projects at an aggregate level. And the aggregate level refers now to the collection uh, of projects. And now uh, the very last uh, definition there still tries to say this uh, uh, second last definitions uh, uh, content in another way. It says that product portfolio management includes in practice continuous optimizing of the existing collection of projects by simultaneously creating and initiating new projects, removing or killing specific projects and putting specific projects on hold and prioritizing projects in terms of their importance and urgency. And everything this is done in order to meet or exceed the goals or the strategy of the firm. Okay. Um, we, we have here a, a picture about the project portfolio management process. And uh, this picture illustrates a three-level uh, organizational uh, hierarchy. Uh, at the top there is the company level. Uh, uh, at the middle there is the portfolio uh, level. Or uh, if you we like, we would call that uh, kind of a middle management level or a departmental level. And then uh, at the uh, bottom uh, there is the project level. Well, uh, if we look at the uh, middle level there, uh, we start uh, with finding new opportunities, new project proposals. That is what the ideas or the project ideas is about. And we are going to talk about uh, the ideas at the latter part or at the end part of uh, this lecture. Uh, then the next uh, step is evaluation of single projects. We are going to look at that uh, in this lecture. Then we are going to look at the project portfolio mod modeling phase, which comes next. And when we have modeled the portfolio uh, and having certain methods for doing that, then we make the portfolio decision, uh, which is the third uh, phase after the ideation of finding new opportunities, which was the starting. Uh, uh, or the point of uh, department, uh, departure here. Well, mm, uh, then uh, uh, the portfolio decision uh, is something that I want to uh, emphasize here. We make the decision about the portfolio. And uh, we are concerned about the whole portfolio, not about single projects uh, per se. Uh, and uh, this means uh, that it is not the fault of a single project if a very profitable project would be killed in the portfolio decision. And why that, for example, could happen? It could be that uh, the most profitable projects are all connected to certain product line or developing products in certain product line. But because we cannot put, uh, let's say, all the eggs uh, in the same basket, so to call, uh, we must also develop in our company other product lines. And even though uh, the very, very profitable projects would all be uh, in one certain uh, product, uh, product line, so uh, there maybe is no idea to start investing in the fourth and fifth and uh, uh, sixth and seventh uh, uh, project in that same product line. But we must balance the uh, uh, portfolio uh, by also investing in some other uh, product line. Or uh, 
even though very profitable projects are also uh, high risk projects often. So we cannot have all projects that are high uh, profit ex uh, expectancy projects with high risk. But we also uh, must have uh, other kinds of uh, projects which are kind of a uh, lower profit uh, or uh, moderate profit and, and, and low risk projects uh, to kind of uh, ensure the cash flow uh, of our uh, company. Okay, uh, those might be, uh, for example, uh, um, justifications of, uh, for example, killing uh, maybe even the most profitable uh, uh, projects or, or projects that are among the most uh, profitable ones. Then um, the portfolio decision uh, always affects uh, projects a certain uh, way uh, or some way. Uh, and uh, that's why from the por uh, portfolio decision there is the kind of arrow to the uh, project level and uh, to that uh, kind of a, uh, uh, brings uh, the project decision as a kind of a consequence or a project decision that is included in a way implicitly in the portfolio decision. And I animate here in this picture also now here the uh, project life cycle uh, to kind of emphasize uh, the idea visually that uh, the projects uh, at the project level uh, are temporal uh, uh, entities where uh, they make progress all the time and they are dynamic. And then there is the kind of a feedback loop again to evaluation of single projects and uh, portfolio modeling and uh, portfolio decisions and that is made uh, as a kind of a continuous uh, process. Okay, uh, now next let's talk about what is strategy and how strategy might be connected to uh, project portfolio management. Well, in this uh, next picture there is a, a general definition of uh, strategy. Strategy is, uh, well, it includes uh, setting goals and priorities and uh, determining actions uh, to achieve the goals. And of course, uh, then also mobilizing resources to execute the actions. Mm -hmm. um, and we learned uh, in the first lecture that uh, projects can be seen as temporary organizations, uh, which provide the means for setting such goals, the strategic goals and priorities, and uh, determining actions. Uh, to achieve those goals. And also project portfolio management aims to use projects uh, for that purpose. So aim, aims to use projects as means of setting goals connected to strategy and determining and implementing uh, the inherent actions. Okay, now next I have this uh, multiple choice question to you. In your opinion which ones of the following statements are true and the statement or statements are the following. If a project idea is not aligned with the firm's strategy, then there are four alternatives uh, to continue this statement. Which one or which ones uh, of those are uh, true according to your opinion? And if you want to think about uh, that, you can put the video on pause for a while because now I'm going to uh, tell how I would tick my answer uh, uh, in relation to these uh, four statements. First, it is reasonable to kill the project. I would not tick this uh, statement. I would not uh, take this alternative because uh, it is not ca categorically so that, uh, that uh, 
if the project uh, is not aligned with the firm, a firm strategy, so it should be killed. It can be killed, but it, 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 it's, it's not necessarily so. Then also the second uh, statement, I wouldn't tick that uh, neither. So before the implementation, the project should be redesigned to have a match with the strategy. Not necessarily so, neither. You can uh, start uh, uh, changing uh, the project and uh, redesigning the projects to fit a better to strategy, but uh, uh, not necessarily always uh, so. So uh, I wouldn't take it. Um, the third one, that one I would uh, tick and say that according to my opinion, I would, could argue that this is true. In its current form, the project can be important for the future of the company. And my reasoning is that because it is so different, it doesn't match the category. Uh, well, it, it doesn't match uh, the uh, strategy, so it uh, really includes uh, something new and uh, it really can be important uh, for the future of the company. Not necessarily so, but, uh, but uh, really because of uh, the uh, contrast to strategy. So it might for that reason be really important and uh, uh, might be something that even renews the strategy. And now we come to the fourth uh, statement. Inspired by the project, the firm strategy should be analyzed in a new light. Yes, at least we should think about whether there is something th uh, that uh, uh, would uh, uh, encourage or inspire us to renew the strategy of the firm. And that is also the kind of a way how projects can be linked to strategy, not necessarily in a hierarchical manner that the strategy uh, comes first and the projects always follow, but it can be that projects renew strategy. Okay. Now, if we continue from this fourth statement, this next picture, uh, which is adapted by uh, the famous uh, strategy uh, scholar Minchberg, uh, so uh, uh, tells uh, partly this uh, story. First, we have the intended strategy. We have a plan and uh, we have deliberate strategy, uh, which uh, follows uh, the uh, intended strategy, but then we have also a vector uh, about unrealized strategy. Not uh, all of this strategy kind of a, uh, becomes implemented. And then we have here the emergent strategy or autonomous strategy process, which kind of a comes uh, from the actual actions and patterns and uh, and, and, and evolution and projects can bring such emergent strategies uh, up front and uh, the actual realized strategy is the sum of these ve vectors which means that uh, there might be projects that have renewed the strategy to become realized strategies. And then there is the feedback uh, loop in this picture. Okay, uh, next we are going to talk about uh, the three project portfolio management objectives. And those objectives are maximizing the value, link to strategy and balance in the portfolio. So in this picture, here they are three project portfolio management objectives. And in the following picture, we have these same objectives and now we have listed some methods or management approaches uh, on the, these, each of these uh, uh, objectives uh, to indicate what kind of a methods we might use uh, to uh, induce uh, those kinds of uh, objectives uh, to come true. 
Well, first, maximizing the value of the portfolio. Well, um, many times uh, companies traditionally have used uh, kind of a profitability calculations or investment calculation type of uh, 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 well uh, methods uh, for evaluating uh, the value of, uh, of, of, of single projects, uh, projects and also uh, partly the value of the whole portfolio. So net present value, uh, internal uh, rate of return, return on investment. But of course we must understand that the value is also much more than just the monetary value. So we might have for example aesthetic value or we might have a kind of a certain kind of a uh, easy to use uh, value or sustainability is a value of it itself uh, when we are implementing the project and then when the project product the system is in use how sustainable it, it is uh, what about the responsibility of our uh, company to make uh, such products uh, that uh, uh, are sustainable uh, for the environment and for the society Okay, then uh, again, uh, or still there are these uh, bullets about cost-benefit analysis and uh, scoring models. Scoring models refer to kind of a scores that we can uh, put uh, to projects uh, for certain criteria. For example, uh, scoring uh, certain uh, characteristic of a project from one to five points or, or so. Okay, then we have uh, the second uh, objective is linked to strategy and uh, we refer here in the second bullet uh, to strategic fit and that refers to uh, the fact that how each project or one, how a single project fulfills uh, the strategic objectives. That is strategic fit of that project. But then we have in the next bullet a strategic priority which kind of refers to the whole collection of projects and, uh, and uh, kind of uh, uh, emphasizes the fact that uh, how the projects or the collection of projects as a whole uh, support strategic objectives. Not only single projects but uh, all projects that we have selected to the portfolio. Well, then there are uh, top-down approaches like this strat strategic buckets uh, model like uh, that we have decided from top-down that we use 10% of the budget to research projects, 30% of the budget uh, to new product development projects and uh, 60% of the budget to organizational change, to changing uh, and improving our organizations, uh, organization. And if we don't have enough project ideas or projects to each of these buckets, so then we should invent and uh, ideate new uh, projects uh, to kind of uh, make, for example, 60% of the budget to be uh, true that we can invest in the organizational change if we have strategically decided from top to down that we are going to invest 60% of the budget to organizational change. Or then we can have these bottom-up approaches that we have already certain projects or project ideas going on and uh, we uh, evaluate them and we score them and we calculate the, the profitability and uh, evaluate them uh, um, for certain criteria and then we make a kind of a uh, portfolio, uh, the kind of a selected projects that we have selected uh, from bottom up to those uh, project uh, 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 initial uh, project candidates that, that we have uh, to, to be 
uh, that, that are available and we can uh, uh, select them in, in our portfolio. Well, then the third uh, uh, objective is balance in the portfolio. And uh, we have several dimensions uh, or criteria that we can use to uh, evaluate uh, the projects. And then we can uh, create, uh, for example, bubble diagrams. Soon I'm going to show you what bubble diagrams are. Uh, or other diagrams or strategy table uh, to uh, look at uh, our selected portfolio as a whole and we can make such portfolio decisions or we can uh, alter the portfolio to be more, uh, let's say, uh, balanced, for example, uh, in terms of certain criteria. And we are going to discuss about uh, these uh, methods, these uh, visual uh, representations uh, a little bit later. Well, uh, to illustrate how um, complicated a uh, de uh, portfolio decision might be, so I have here an example, a uh, uh, multiple choice question to you. And uh, the case is the following. Uh, we have a neighbor uh, limited liability company, uh, uh, which has an aim to expand its business to neighboring countries, uh, from, that is from Finland. We uh, have uh, the aim to expand uh, to Sweden and to Estonia, uh, and we do this by launching new products uh, or product variants to those markets. So we do product development uh, projects or improvements uh, to products uh, uh, as projects. And we have three project ideas, A, B and C. And A is about further development uh, 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 about the pro uh, product that was recently launched, uh, launched in the Swedish market and the cost uh, of that uh, project is 70,000 euros and the expected profitability net present value is 40,000. Uh, project B uh, that is a product development for the Estonian market based on a very new project idea uh, uh, and the cost is 50,000 and the business case is very ambiguous and we don't even have initial data to calculate the net present value uh, in a reliable manner and uh, uh, we still have estimated or the technical and marketing personnel has estimated uh, that uh, in the best case, the profitability of this project is really huge, but so is the risk. Then uh, project C, uh, improvement of a product which has uh, already been uh, in the Swedish market for a long time. Uh, and the cost of the improvement is 30,000 and uh, the net, net present value is uh, 10,000 euros. And now we know that the total budget of the neighbor uh, LTD uh, for this uh, product development project is 100,000. And the question to us is that which of the two possible project combinations uh, would uh, we choose in neighbor LTD's portfolio? First A or C or B and C? Uh, well, sorry. A and C is the first option and the second is B and C. And uh, uh, there is a notion that uh, the choice of A and B is not possible because then we would exceed our 100,000 budget. So we have only these two uh, options. And uh, still in the very end of this picture there is the notion that, uh, that uh, when making uh, our choice uh, we should think about the possible arguments uh, why uh, we would justify uh, this choice that we would make, the first or the, the, the second alternative. If you want to think about uh, the uh, possible answer to this uh, question, so you can now still again uh, put uh, your video in, on pause 
and uh, now I'm going to provide my reasoning uh, about uh, which alternatives we could choose and, and possibly why. First, if we choose A and C, then our both projects would be in the Swedish markets. So in certain way there is no balance in the portfolio in terms of uh, the uh, mar uh, regional market areas. However, uh, we would uh, put all 100,000 budget uh, uh, in as an investment and uh, we have calculated a kind of a fire sure profit uh, in terms of uh, net present value. However, maybe we would have uh, there uh, just a kind of average profit and uh, not that uh, much risk taking included in uh, those projects. But if we would choose the second alternative where we, we would choose B and C, then uh, B would be really a high profit and high risk uh, option for us. And if we would uh, take that alternative, uh, then we would have a certain kind of a balance between a high risk, high profit, that is project B and C, which is a kind of a uh, moderate uh, risk and uh, average profit, for example, if we would like to uh, uh, consider those figures uh, in, in that way. So, uh, um, we cannot necessarily say uh, which alternative uh, A and C or B and C uh, is, is better, but we can already now understand that they are completely different alternatives and uh, we can understand how uh, complicated the decision making even uh, in this kind of a simple case where we only have three projects is we must uh, uh, make trade-offs and we must be capable of choosing uh, either from two good alternatives or two not so good alternatives, however we would like to call it, but the decision making is about decision making and that is always a little bit challenging. Okay, um, if we still consider uh, this uh, uh, question and this multiple choice uh, case here, I would say that uh, uh, it is also relevant to understand that who makes the decision. Uh, many times uh, if it is uh, the uh, middle management, uh, the middle management is not necessarily a risk taker. And they maybe many times they want to uh, follow the strategy. They are not they don't even feel maybe authorized to take big risks, but they may want to make rather fire sure decisions and therefore they might be willing uh, to choose projects where we have been able to calculate uh, net present values and all profitabilities and so on. Maybe my comment also here is that uh, that uh, are those projects that where we really can calculate uh, the profits, are they only mediocre or average projects and not that kind of a, uh, let's say, radical or good in terms of uh, bringing something really new to the company. Um, we have been researching certain companies where uh, there has been uh, innovation boards or development boards uh, uh, made uh, of uh, uh, middle management representatives. We can compare these uh, innovation boards and uh, development boards now to, for example, project portfolio boards. And their uh, 
task has been to select uh, from certain project ideas uh, those that uh, the company should invest in. All of those boards or those companies claim that uh, they appreciate newness. Newness and uh, especially radical ideas and they want to invest in them. But in practice, when we looked what kind of ideas they invested in, they really maybe took those ideas where uh, uh, certain uh, good uh, Profits uh, were able. We were able to calculate uh, the, the profit figures, uh, which uh, were average or good, and uh, in that way they kind of made certain kind of a fire sure decisions. But they uh, didn't have courage to uh, make the decisions uh, to uh, have the company to invest or even to look at uh, the really wild ideas that would have probably. Uh, taken the company to a different kind of a future. Um, okay, um, now this picture here is uh, illustrating the stage gate or phase uh, review uh, process of a project that should be familiar to us from the first lecture. Okay, uh, in the innovation, in innovation projects or new product development projects, we often manage projects as uh, uh, phases and decision-making points, which are these gates in between the phases where we make uh, decisions uh, and what kind of a decisions we make at these gates. No, so uh, the decisions from the Portfolio point of view uh, uh, are the following. There are at least four alternatives. One decision that we might make at the gate is go to the next phase. Okay, we can proceed. Second, return to the previous phase. We must still do something before we can let the project to proceed. Or the third one, put on hold. Not yet. For example, uh, because of uh, resource constraints, we don't have resources for uh, all projects, we must put some projects on hold. Or for, for some other reasons, we are not uh, uh, sure whether we can make the decision yet, so we put that aside, this project aside for a while. Or then fourth uh, option, we can kill the project. Okay, we can see that when the project has developed to a certain point, uh, we have acquired uh, knowledge and learning, and also the environment perhaps has changed a little bit, uh, and the circumstances are different, and then we can uh, only maybe make the decision that, okay, let's not proceed, let's kill the project, because it doesn't bring enough, uh, let's say, good for the company, uh, at least not enough good uh, comp uh, when we are comparing it to other projects uh, in the portfolio, for example. Now I have uh, uh, this red text coming uh, as animated text in this slide. Well, uh, I want uh, now to underline that in the gates in the decision-making points, we normally use certain kinds of criteria and we are going to look at those criteria uh, in the, some of the next uh, slides. And we are also going to refer uh, in this lecture to a formal process. And with a formal process, uh, we uh, uh, refer to this kind of a uh, stage gate process, uh, which is rather systematic way of taking the project forward, and it normally includes those criteria that we use in those decision making points. Okay, so remember this uh, uh, word or wording formal process, and remember that it refers to uh, this kind of approach, which is now illustrated in this picture. And we come to the, this formal process a little bit later. 
Well, um, now when in the previous picture we have a process of a single project, now we have put the projects uh, to the low, lower part of this uh, kind of a three level hierarchy uh, of a company uh, decision making. And then uh, at the middle level there are portfolio board meetings. And then at the top uh, there are portfolio re uh, reviews uh, typically made uh, in uh, the senior executive or uh, upper management uh, board meetings. And these portfolio meetings uh, could be uh, uh, made, for example, uh, uh, rather frequently, for example, once a month uh, in a regular manner. And then these portfolio reviews with the upper management, maybe just a uh, uh, few times a year. And uh, we can see from this picture uh, that uh, uh, the dotted arrows, they describe that the data is accumulated or knowledge is accumulated from projects uh, up to the uh, higher level uh, meetings, portfolio uh, board meetings and uh, those portfolio reviews. And also because in portfolio board meetings and these portfolio reviews, portfolio decisions are made, then uh, what is not illustrated in this picture is that uh, from those uh, board meetings, uh, the decisions and uh, the, their implications and uh, actions, they kind of come down uh, to the project level. And I think that this is a really important notion to uh, uh, consider, that uh, it is not only that uh, the data is collected and then boards make uh, the decisions, but it is rather important that in those board meetings, uh, those uh, managers and executives who are participating to those board meetings, they agreed uh, that uh, uh, certain members of the meeting, they go and discuss with the project managers uh, that are involved uh, uh, by these uh, portfolio decisions and uh, they explain why we made this kind of a decision. Uh, they kind of uh, provide uh, the feedback from the upper management. And in this way, uh, we have a kind of a organic uh, organizational setting uh, where uh, there is communication, not only one-way communication, but two-way communication and communication up and down uh, between uh, the subordinates and the managers. If this doesn't happen, if uh, there will no, not be information from uh, top to down, then uh, there is a danger that the project managers and project people get demotivated. Uh, they think uh, that uh, the decisions are made in uh, closed cabinets and uh, we never hear about uh, what they have de been deciding and why. And uh, uh, in the kind of a harshest uh, uh, situation, we just uh, have a rather unfavorable uh, decisions of having our project killed or put on hold and, or, or, or so. And even if a certain project uh, is not changed uh, or the status of that project or priority of that project is not changed in those portfolio meetings, I think that it's important that the executives, they uh, go down, they walk uh, uh, among their subordinates and they tell what was discussed in the meetings and why, for example, uh, the status of uh, the certain uh, project was not changed. That is also a kind of a decision of not doing anything. Uh, it, it is implicitly a decision. Then when we are looking at this picture, uh, I think that there are a few other uh, things that we must uh, now uh, underline or it, it is uh, worthwhile to underline. Another thing is that uh, when we have well-organized project portfolio management and we have these portfolio board meetings, then uh, 
we can save uh, the managers or executives time because it is enough that they sit and make decisions in the portfolio board meetings uh, on, uh, regularly. And they don't need, the executives don't need to sit in each and uh, every single project uh, board. They can let the project uh, to kind of uh, proceed and evolve if it goes like uh, informed or like planned. Uh, so it is enough uh, that regularly the project situations are followed in portfolio boards. The executives don't need to uh, spend so much time in uh, sitting in uh, each and every project uh, uh, board. Then one another thing uh, that I want now to emphasize here that when we are uh, using the term portfolio board meetings and uh, the word portfolio board uh, I want to emphasize the fact that the portfolio boards are not necessarily separate boards that are established uh, just for project portfolio decision making, but uh, it is uh, a, a natural uh, thing that these boards are existing bodies. They are pre-existing boards uh, in the firm's hierarchy. And just those boards are uh, taking the role of making portfolio decisions every now and then or uh, uh, as some part of their uh, regular, more generic uh, board meetings. So don't uh, over-organize or uh, kind of uh, establish uh, new uh, bodies like project portfolio boards, but use uh, those uh, uh, existing boards uh, as portfolio boards uh, that uh, are already authorized uh, to have the role of a managerial or executive board. Okay, well, uh, we are going to come back a little bit uh, towards the end of this uh, lecture about this kind of organizational hierarchy and project portfolio boards. And we are going to talk also about project management offices. Uh, let's come later back and uh, talk about these kind of organizational, organizational roles in the firm. Now, in this picture, we are showing here uh, uh, a portfolio decision-making funnel. And to the left, uh, there are ideas or there are multiple sources of ideas. And uh, then uh, we have uh, certain decision-making points, uh, gates, uh, where we uh, kind of uh, kill those ideas or uh, uh, decide uh, to take certain ideas to the next uh, phase and, and so on. And uh, what this picture uh, tells us or we, how we can interpret this is that uh, there is this kind of a paradoxical setting where we should be able to create uh, as many new and refreshing project ideas as possible. And how we do that, we can have idea campaigns, we can have uh, several methods of kind of ideating uh, project ideas. But we want to maximize the number of project ideas. Uh, and uh, in the next step, however, we want to kill as many uh, of them as possible to kind of uh, uh, carve out the most uh, promising ideas. And because we don't have resources to start resourcing on too many projects, the company would be clogged by uh, such a thing of, of uh, advancing too many projects. We must uh, kill or put on hold as many as possible to uh, uh, give the possibility for those most promising uh, ones to be taken forward and flourish and finally uh, be extremely successful. Okay, 
So a kind of a paradoxical setting maximize the number of uh, new ideas and then maximize uh, the uh, number of killed ideas in a way. Okay, now uh, we are going to look at uh, the evaluation of single projects. At the bottom of this picture we uh, are indicating uh, with this uh, red box that we are concentrating on evaluating on uh, an evaluation methods of, of, of single projects. So uh, there are uh, numerical methods, uh, there is classification and scoring methods, methods based on question lists and methods based on expert opinions and subjective estimates. Okay, let's look at these methods uh, 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 next. And then there is a notion that uh, estimates should be uh, updated continuously for uh, upcoming next portfolio board meetings. So this is kind of a continuous uh, decision making process what we are aiming uh, at and continuous analysis of those projects as well. Okay, uh, I don't necessarily want you to kind of uh, now uh, take too much uh, this kind of a very um, uh, strict calculation oriented methods uh, in, in your heart. But in the next uh, I will show uh, a kind of a, uh, the idea of a, a decision three type of evaluation where we could uh, uh, calculate for example expected commercial uh, value if we just would have uh, the initial data to do so. But this can also be uh, taken, you can also take this as a kind of a idea of a principle of how to uh, evaluate or predict the, the future outcomes of a project. And if uh, I would uh, emphasize something in uh, this picture or some uh, variables in this, this picture, I would uh, raise uh, these two marked in red color. So uh, first there is the kind of a market dimension, probability of commercial success. And then there is the kind of a technical or product dimension, product or technology. The product or technology dimension uh, uh, refers to whether there is a probability to make technical success, whether we can develop a kind of a newness in terms of the product or wh whether uh, we have the skills for certain uh, technology and its development. And then the market uh, dimension uh, uh, takes uh, up the question about the market segments, uh, segments and customers and whether someone is going to buy and pay about this, this kind of a product. So there is a market uncertainty, product uncertainty, technology uh, uh, or product uncertainty and also uh, these uncertainties uh, are in, in a kind of positive way they are turned into kind of a opportunities or possibilities uh, for success. Well, now um, typical uh, project uh, selection or prioritization criteria in project portfolio management uh, are shown in this uh, picture. And these criteria are used in scoring models. I have few other pictures uh, in, uh, in the next slides uh, where I can elaborate also uh, uh, these particular uh, criteria. Uh, the leverage score competencies, there, the third bullet here uh, refers to the ability uh, of uh, the use of the company's resources or whether we have a fit between our capabilities, whether we really can uh, successfully do that kind of a project or not, uh, whether that is our area in terms of capabilities or knowledge at all. Okay, um, well, we many times uh, we uh, categorize these pro 
criteria into must meet and should, uh, should meet criteria. The must meet criteria, uh, they are uh, criteria that must be definitely uh, fulfilled. For example, there is kind of some legal reasons we must do things according to the law, or then there is a kind of a uh, health, safety and environment, a kind of a zero tolerance uh, things that we must do anyways, whatever that project costs. So we must follow the law, we must uh, uh, kind of uh, secure everyone's health, uh, we can uh, not put anyone on risk in terms of health and safety, and, 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 and those projects just must be done. If, if, if these criteria are, are, are not met with. Okay, then uh, should meet criteria. Uh, these are the criteria where we can really uh, compare the goodness of uh, the uh, projects. Well, strategic product advantage, whether the product is well received by the customers, market attra uh, at, uh, attractiveness, then this synergist thing, whether it is synergetic with our resources and capabilities, with it, with it, whether it leverages the core competences of the company, and then there is a the technical feasibility, uh, whether we can really do the project or the product in terms of uh, technical, uh, well, uh, connected to technical challenges, and then there is the risk and, and, and return uh, issue. Again, I would say that this uh, repeats uh, a little bit of the previous uh, lists of the criteria. This is taken from one source, uh, uh, and there are six uh, upper, uh, well, uh, six main uh, rubrics of, of criteria, like strategic project product markets. And, and these three first ones, uh, which are uh, marked with red color, are now illustrated as this kind of a table or upper part of the uh, criteria table uh, on, on the right of this picture. And uh, this particular literature source where we have taken this from, uh, so uh, also uh, suggests using weights. Uh, and uh, I am a little bit critical of using weights and uh, weighting uh, the actual scores that we have produced. For example, the score for from one to five, uh, or scores from one to uh, one to ten, and and, and then uh, multiplying them with a kind of a weight factor. Uh, and uh, uh, why I am a little bit critical for using those weights is that uh, that uh, my philosophy would be to kind of a uh, uh, keep uh, the estimate and the decision, or the analysis and the decision separate. And uh, using weights, in a way, it kind of blurs a little bit uh, the estimate, estimates of certain criteria, and it puts uh, emphasis on certain criteria. And if uh, the ultimate uh, aim is to kind of uh, then finally just to select, uh, for example, the biggest figure or the project uh, or with a criteria, certain criteria with biggest criter, uh, figure, then I would say that uh, we have been uh, somehow blurring or intermixing uh, the evalu uh, lays, evaluation and estimation and the decision making by just putting weights and thinking that we just should make decision to take the uh, project with the biggest uh, number in a way. Okay, now we have here uh, the three f uh, first, uh, let's say, main uh, uh, classes of the cr uh, criteria illustrated in this uh, table, and in the next uh, picture here we have uh, the rest three uh, criteria. Uh, that is the leverage, the core competences, technical feasibility, and risk versus reward. So we have the, uh, let's say, uh, lower part of the criteria table in this picture. Okay. 
Then, uh, one important thing to emphasize is that we can use uh, written or verbal uh, uh, descriptions uh, of uh, the characteristics of projects that we are evaluating. And uh, we can uh, do that by using question lists. We can have pre-prepared uh, uh, question lists uh, where we, for example, in, uh, if we have uh, new product development projects, we can uh, have product or technology related questions. For example, do we have the competence of capability to develop a product using this kind of technology? What are the uncertainties related to technical issues in development? And when we are answering to these uh, uh, pre-prepared uh, qu uh, questions, so we can then have a rather in-depth uh, analysis and uh, understanding and elaboration of the uh, actual uh, possibilities for making success or or, or, or then uh, risks or whatever uh, the actual criteria are what we are going to use for our final decisions. Then we could also have market related questions, for example, which is the obvious customer segment for this kind of a product? Are customers willing to pay and how much for such a product? What are the biggest uncertainties in the market? So, question lists and written or oral kind of uh, uh, representations of uh, the uh, characteristics of the project. That is important part of the evaluation. Not only by trying to turn everything into numbers and scores and then uh, picking uh, projects with uh, certain numerical uh, values. Well, uh, next, uh, from these question lists and from written uh, uh, elaboration, uh, I think that it's natural to uh, talk about uh, expert opinions and subjective estimates in this slide. Well, definitely because we are uh, making decisions and evaluating the future uh, uh, by looking at the collection of projects, we must use experts, expert networks, different kind of work groups or Delphi methods, brainstorming, external ev evaluations and intu intuitive best estimates. And uh, really subjective uh, expert estimates are important and perhaps the most rich part of the evaluation. Uh, and also the project portfolio boards can discuss very deeply uh, in the board meetings uh, about the decisions to come and about the decisions they, that they, they did make and the reasoning behind. That is important. Definitely uh, this point number three or number th uh, item number three, the, the metrics and systematic methods, these kind of a scores and so on are rather important to catalyze these kinds of discussions and these kinds of uh, written or uh, oral uh, uh, elaboration of, of uh, certain projects and, and their criteria. Now, uh, in the item number four in this picture, uh, I have the example of pet projects that is uh, taken from uh, Christoph Locke's uh, study of an European technology manufacturer. And uh, he researched uh, some uh, 100 uh, new product development projects, uh, each of which were in a way uh, about to take uh, the company or the products to a kind of a uh, new business, a little bit new business that comes with the uh, new, new product or the developmental uh, scheme. Well, uh, there is a definition that the PET project is a project which is sponsored and supported by a senior executive belonging to the firm's upper management. 
And then the 4A includes a kind of a sub bullet, which says that uh, because a senior executive uses uh, their authority and power to initiate and advance their pet project, it is unnecessarily to take this pet project to a formal process and start scoring or evaluating and making profitability calculations. Uh, you simply don't need to do that because uh, it is the senior executive's pet project and uh, they have decided that it will be done and it will be implemented. So it is selected to the portfolio based on their uh, decision and their authority and power. Uh, the 4B says uh, that uh, the decision to initiate and execute a pet project uh, could be based on the senior executive's strong strategic vision and will, or some irrational preferences or personal motives. But 4C here at the very bottom of this uh, picture says that uh, Locke argues uh, that uh, the different ways to select the project uh, in the portfolio, like through a formal process or as a pet project, or then I'm going to also to uh, raise the concept of under the table project. Whatever this way of selecting the project to the portfolio would be, so there is no particularly difference uh, between the successes or failures of these projects that are selected to the pro uh, portfolio in different ways. And this tells that we need different ways of selecting projects to the portfolio. The formal process, even though that looks like a very systematic one, and that is a systematic one, that is not the only one. And uh, let's uh, elaborate a little bit uh, this issue. Maybe the next uh, slide and the next uh, multiple choice question and the answers to that multiple choice question explains why uh, many kinds of processes might be needed, even like uh, having this kind of a pet project type of a process where the senior executive uh, uh, chooses the projects uh, to be implemented. Okay, now the question is that in your opinion, which ones of the following statements are true? First, uh, uh, the case description uh, to uh, think about these uh, alternatives. If a senior executive belonging to the firm's upper management decides to start a project that clearly is a pet project, then before the project start, however, and then there are uh, four statements. And again, if you like, you can stop uh, the video, you can pause, uh, put the video on pause and then uh, think about uh, how you would uh, answer to these uh, four different statements, which in your opinion, uh, uh, which ones are true. And now I'm going to tell my answers to you. First one. It would be desire, desirable that the firm's personnel could influence the decision. So, for example, the decision of whether to start the project and with uh, which scope could be made according to the suggestion supported by the majority of the personnel. So, uh, per, the personnel could kind of uh, discuss or choose or vote or participate in the decision making. I would not choose this alternative. I would not think that this would be true. Uh, I understand and, that I, and I appreciate the fact that, uh, that participation uh, and involvement of personal uh, and, and each and every individual uh, should be somehow uh, kind of appreciated and taken into account when making decisions. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, 
there is a role uh, that the top management has, the upper management has, and they must do their decisions. It ca this cannot be uh, a kind of a voting uh, decision, especially if the pet project uh, is a controversial one. Maybe in that case especially uh, the kind of a big mass of uh, uh, the personnel uh, cannot make uh, the decision realistically. For example, uh, then there, there, there might even be a kind of a resistance to change. So if the decisions uh, would be to take the company to kind of a totally new era with new products, with new way of producing, with new customers and everything. So I think that uh, quite many of uh, the uh, organization uh, would resist the change and it would be uh, impossible perhaps to explain uh, for the executive to explain everyone or, or someone to explain everyone why we must do things completely differently than, than we did before. Okay, uh, then the second one, the senior executive should acquire a consensus decision to start with the project from their colleagues uh, in the board of uh, directors meeting. I wouldn't tick this neither. And I think that uh, the senior executives, each of them have certain areas uh, to uh, take forward in their company. And uh, it is not kind of a question of uh, the board, executive board making uh, the decision, but I think that uh, each and every senior executive maybe should uh, 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 advance their own responsibility area. And uh, besides, uh, the consensus decisions are uh, perhaps the worst decisions of all because uh, no one tends to take responsibility of a consensus decision. So if we make a decision in a board, so uh, no one kind of a, uh, uh, serves as a champion who takes uh, uh, this decision uh, through uh, successfully. It is even better that uh, some other executive members in the board are kind of a, uh, skeptical, uh, skeptic uh, about uh, this uh, certain uh, executive's initiative and uh, they just let him to do it or them to do it uh, and then this uh, one single individual, this one executive must show and must commit uh, that uh, this really is successful and uh, he's committed really to take it through and manage it and foresee that uh, that uh, pet project will bring something, bring out something valuable. Okay, then uh, the third uh, statement. Different motives and justifications to start the pet project should be carefully analyzed before the start of the project. Okay, I wouldn't tick this neither. So, uh, how can you find out the different motives and justifications? Maybe there is not means to do that. And uh, my reasoning is the following. Uh, senior executives talk with other senior executives and even politicians and so on at their level. And there is a kind of a information and data and intuition uh, that is in included uh, in a kind of a making a strategic vision. And they never can explain, they cannot even disclose uh, the information that they have when they have been discussing uh, confidentially with other uh, executives and, and where they have got uh, their information and uh, they probably would not be able even to justify everyone to kind of a comprehend what the kind of a top executives mindset uh, should be because the others are not top e executives. Uh, the fourth, fourth one, uh, this is a statement that I would tick as true. 
The senior executive should be given the freedom to make their decision because in this way the executive takes the responsibility and uses the power that their upper management role authorizes them to. Well, yes, uh, they must take the responsibility and uh, sometimes they must uh, run projects and uh, make projects uh, to be initiated that almost everyone resists and uh, everyone is against. But they see that the future of the company, uh, looking at the future of the company, this must be done to take a leap forward and uh, make the future of the company successful. And uh, it might be really a kind of a hard decision uh, to uh, make a change project or to develop completely different kinds of uh, products uh, that the uh, current organization or the lower level of the organization couldn't even be dreaming about. And they just uh, must uh, push the project through. No question. Questions about that. That is done. It is my pet project and uh, it will be done. That's it. Okay. Um, this probably explains why uh, different ways of selecting the projects to the portfolio can be suc successful. So the executives take re the, uh, their uh, responsibility or uses their authority and uh, make the projects through. They are confident that it will be successful and so on. And if they fail, then uh, I think that executives are changed uh, quite often uh, in big corporations even. So if they cannot kind of uh, increase the value for the company, so uh, many times the executives uh, must uh, go and, uh, and new executives are hired uh, to make the next try in, in a way. Okay, uh, then uh, next we are going to talk about the portfolio modeling and uh, portfolio evaluation. And uh, we are familiar with these uh, three objectives of project portfolio management. Maximizing the value of the portfolio linked to strategy and balance the portfolio. And now uh, in the next pictures we show uh, few methods or certain methods uh, to uh, make this portfolio modeling and evaluation. Uh, partly they are visual methods, uh, the bubble diagrams or strategy tables. And uh, this picture, for example, now shows uh, three different bubble diagrams. The projects are marked uh, in a diagram as a bubble. And uh, there are actually uh, two uh, dimensions in each of these uh, uh, bubble diagrams. For example, in the first one there is the risk and uh, uh, the profit or uh, reward, uh, risk and the re reward. And, uh, uh, when the projects are uh, scored, uh, for example, uh, uh, with the scores of from 1 to 5, they can be positioned in this uh, diagram in uh, uh, terms of uh, these uh, two uh, uh, kind of a dimensions. And how we choose these two dimensions that we have now uh, in this illustrative uh, bubble diagrams, so it is uh, according to how the decision maker or how the uh, person who is preparing for the decision or evaluating the portfolio wants to make. So they must choose uh, the dimensions and start uh, kind of a looking at uh, the project portfolio according to certain uh, dimensions. 
But each of these bubble diagrams, they include not only two dimensions, but actually implicitly they include several dimensions. For example, the size of the bubble refers to the uh, resourcing of the project. Resourcing in terms of cost or man hours or some other measure of resourcing. Then we can have the color of uh, the bubble. And the color of the bubble might refer to project type. For example, uh, product development, uh, organizational change, um, investment uh, to uh, production system or, or, or some other project type. And uh, then we can also have some kind of a uh, uh, illustration of kind of a, uh, uh, making some other uh, um, visualization of the uh, bubble than uh, the kind of a color like, uh, like uh, having squares or lines or, or, or some other ways of making the bubbles different uh, to indicate for example the product line or uh, some geographical area where uh, we aim uh, as, as a market segment with this development project or some other criterion. So uh, by, this, uh, by looking at this way, this bubble diagram, so I listed at least five different dimensions that one single bubble diagram can include. Okay. Um, uh, then uh, we have here another example of a bubble diagram that doesn't bring us much uh, new to what we already looked. So uh, uh, maybe one aspect that uh, we can see here uh, as a kind of a, uh, a marking technique is that, that uh, at the Top right corner, uh, we have here that the size of the bubble uh, refers to resources, and then the shading uh, refers to timing. For example, we can uh, categorize the projects in terms of how fast we can get uh, the return or reward or the project completed. So if we want to have different kinds of projects where with some projects they bring uh, let's say, faster, uh, uh, let's say, uh, profit creating capability and others are longer term projects which we must make, for example, for years until they are completed and until we can uh, then have the actual benefits and so on. So we can have also the timing as one way of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of criterion uh, which we mark uh, in those visual representations. Regarding the timing, this picture uh, shows a kind of a more traditional and uh, simple way of uh, putting the projects uh, uh, in the time axis as a project time chart, which tells the same story, which I just explained that uh, when the project is complete and when the project would uh, 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 kind of a bring the actual benefits uh, through their end products. Then uh, this picture about the strategy table, perhaps uh, as, anim as an animated picture, it uh, might uh, uh, show you the kind of a dynamism of uh, thinking about uh, uh, how, how the actual project portfolio is created and how the projects are selected to the uh, portfolio. If we start with four projects, uh, uh, A, B, C and D, and uh, we have here the bubble diagram uh, made uh, of these four projects, 
and the two main dimensions uh, in these diagrams are risk and reward. We have here the strate strategy table where we have columns uh, uh, where we have uh, the strategic objectives of the firm. Objective 1, Objective 2, Objective 3 and Objective 4. And then we have uh, the rows uh, uh, where we have projects, project A, B, C and D. Okay, when we position those projects uh, against uh, the strategic objectives, we can see that projects A, B and C, they all uh, support uh, or are connected uh, to uh, develop uh, something that is aligned with the strategic objective number one. Project A also uh, supports objective two and project B also supports objective three. Okay, then uh, project D uh, uh, doesn't support any of these four objectives, but uh, the project D could uh, give reason to establish a new objective. So we have a new strategic objective based on having the project D. Maybe we can see that uh, we have no project supporting objective for, but we don't need the objective for neither. Maybe we renew the strategy by not only taking this new objective, but also to removing this uh, objective number four. Okay, then uh, we might uh, kill pro project C because we see that project A and B are supporting objective number one. We don't need a third project, project C anymore to support this particular objective. Otherwise our uh, portfolio wouldn't be so balanced or wouldn't be balanced enough. Then uh, we might make a decision that we must uh, create and uh, take in the portfolio another project E that would support uh, objective number two. And also we might have other considerations, for example, that not all projects uh, should be uh, high reward and high risk projects. Not all projects uh, uh, need not to be uh, low reward and low risk projects, neither. But we must have balance also in that respect. And now I still have these uh, words interaction, communication and information distribution, which brings in uh, the uh, written or verbal uh, uh, rich discussion about uh, the characteristics of these projects when we make these decisions. Okay, now um, next we are going to talk about the portfolio decision, which is actually the third phase of this portfolio management process. There we make a decision about which projects we select to the portfolio. Um, and the previous evaluation and modeling phases, uh, they prepare for this portfolio decision. And uh, in this second uh, item, we have this uh, bullet that also the final solution of the group assignment, of your group assignment, is a decision about the portfolio. But, however, the mere decision of its own doesn't have any value without the analysis and reasoning and justifications from the previous phases. So, we must have this bubble diagrams, this elaboration, maybe uh, written reasoning about uh, why we have created this kind of a portfolio. Then uh, again, the third item here says that portfolio decision may affect changes at the project level. It always ha has effects on the project level. Uh, it, uh, the consequence uh, consequences are at the project level of those portfolio decisions. 
And uh, then the fourth uh, item says that in the next portfolio board meeting, a portfolio decision can be made with dif which differs from the decision made in the previous board meeting. So the circumstances change, projects develop, we learn during the projects. We, for example, may learn that uh, these projects don't, uh, or certain projects doesn't uh, actually bring the value that was expected and therefore we must kill it and, and so on. And uh, this uh, decision cycle, uh, well, evaluation of single project portfolio modeling and portfolio decision is repeated continuously uh, on a regular basis and uh, the decisions are made in the project portfolio meetings. Okay, uh, now in this picture I show the three distinct ways which explain how projects are selected in the portfolio and this is based on Christoph Locke's uh, study about the European technology manufacturer where he recognized that uh, there were these three kinds of uh, ways or these kinds of processes. There, there is the formal process which is the kind of a stage gate process and then applying the criteria for scoring and scoring the project so very systematic way. Uh, then uh, we were discussing about the pet projects and uh, we referred to under the table projects. And under the table projects are such projects uh, that uh, the lower level management the project management or some departmental management at a rather low level, uh, they are developing certain projects uh, with they keep aside kind of a hidden under the table from uh, the executives. These under the table projects are very uh, promising projects according to those lower level people's opinion, but they cannot take uh, the projects to the uh, formal process because the formal process would kill them. And why this happens? Uh, this happens because the idea is so new and wild and uh, it is so difficult to make uh, uh, profitability calculations or even to score in a reliable manner uh, the projects. But uh, there is an understanding that there is a big promise in, in the project. Uh, the lower level departments might put a little bit of their budget aside and develop uh, these under the table projects. It doesn't sound very uh, good idea to kind of uh, hide anything in an organization from any, uh, anyone. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, if the uh, management culture would be mature enough and if the top executives would allow, I think that it would be maybe a better idea for the top executive, executives to allow uh, the lower level of the organization to use a little bit money for these kinds of uh, new developments that are not necessarily uh, defined uh, in a very structured way, but very ambiguous ideas that are still worthwhile to develop a little bit further to see whether uh, uh, some very profitable things could come out from those projects. Uh, one aspect uh, connected to under the table project is that uh, the project managers and project people working in projects, many times they know things what the company future needs uh, much before the executives know. It can be that uh, those uh, people working in projects, they uh, know uh, certain things uh, many years uh, ahead of the executives. And why is that? 
these people are working uh, in the technical or technological interface in the projects and they are also working in market interface with the customers. So they have the most updated and most uh, rich information about where the company is going. And executives uh, get that information, know that information uh, or uh, uh, Un get understanding, real understanding what that information means a lot later, maybe years later. And that's why uh, we should take uh, those ideas and project uh, initiatives that uh, uh, raise uh, from the lower levels of the organization, kind of a bottom up. Uh, we, we should take them seriously. Okay. Um, the question of whether a project or project idea is urgent or important, or both, or neither, is interesting. So, is it urgent? Yes or no? Is it important? Yes or no? If it is urgent, then probably it will be done anyways. Also important uh, things are done, but if that is not important, well, it is done, uh, done still, but uh, there is no, not much loss, maybe a little bit too much cost invested in certain no, not important thing, but still it is done. But the problematic uh, part or uh, spot in this uh, picture is those projects or project ideas that are non-urgent but important. So what makes urgency? Many times organizations are fighting with developments and other issues that uh, uh, are short-sighted and uh, uh, they are connected to daily or weekly or monthly. Uh, 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 planning horizons. And also many times uh, the things that the organizations are working with are rather concrete. They are working with current products and improving current products. That makes things urgent because they are current products and uh, we have uh, existing customers and we must develop them. But those projects that we don't still have, they might be very important to develop such pro uh, pro uh, products, but uh, well, there is no urgency because they are very hypothetical and we even don't know yet what the projects to be developed which we don't yet have are. So there is no urgency, no push to start doing uh, such things right away. Another aspect of urgency is that if a competitor has done something that threats our uh, product or uh, market position, then uh, we must respond. And we have really a kind of a threat, concrete threat, and we know what the threat is, that is the kind of a competitor's move. And, uh, that makes our development project or responding to that move very urgent. And there is high urgency that we are working on that. But again, the important uh, things which might not be that acute, so then they are put aside and uh, it is rather, uh, well, difficult to uh, kind of a take them into kind of a developmental pro uh, program of the company for these reasons. For example, uh, when Nokia made uh, mobile phones, uh, it had developments and uh, in a way opportunities to start developing the touch screen uh, new generation mobile phones, but it made decisions uh, decision of not going into that kind of a 
development uh, uh, scheme. Uh, they kind of put aside a very important, potentially a, a very important initiative. And they were concentrating uh, on uh, the current mobile phone models, the current customers, and developing them further. Uh, they were concentrating on urgent issues. And they ignored maybe uh, an important one. Okay. Um, now, um, in the next picture, or in the next pictures, we are going to go in the very beginning of uh, the project portfolio management process to where uh, uh, the new uh, possibilities and new ideas are developed. So we are talking about ideas and ideation, if you like. First, uh, when we have this typical process, stage gate uh, type of a process of an innovation uh, project, uh, we can uh, adhere in the front end, in the very early phase, uh, a kind of a uh, non-linear process uh, to illustrate how uh, uh, we should analyze the opportunities, how we should uh, generate ideas, how uh, the ideas uh, could be selected and how there is an engine in the middle and how this process is very nonlinear. And then in some way from this uh, nonlinear process uh, uh, we get a concept which goes out to NPD, that is new product development, or TSG, which is a technological uh, or technology screening gate. And then we start investing more money into that and, and, and doing the kind of a development uh, for, for uh, the actual product to the market when we have first uh, clarified what the concept is. And concept includes the product, the technology, the market, uh, many business model or business case, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and in that way we have clarity of uh, these dimensions already. Uh, well, uh, creating ideas or finding ideas is challenging. And there are many places where these ideas can come from. Many companies, they uh, generate ideas. They have idea campaigns, for example. And the question in this slide, uh, how the rubric is uh, uh, formulated, is that where the many still unused good project ideas are stored. And if we look at the first bullet, uh, which says that there are strengths and weaknesses uh, of, uh, in the well-structured idea generation methods. So, for example, the company could run idea campaigns supported by idea management systems uh, and, and uh, the companies would have wonderful databases where there, there are a lot of ideas. And uh, the second bullet says that if the company would run an idea campa campaign producing uh, a huge amount of new ideas, then the question is that where and how the many uh, still unused project ideas are stored. So we could gen generate hundreds and hundreds of ideas. We could combine in those systems the ideas. We can uh, find uh, actions uh, with, uh, to those ideas and so on. But we cannot uh, pursue all of them, those ideas, but just we pick few of them and then we have the rest, hundreds and hundreds of them uh, in the idea management system. And the question is, 
that how we could take advance uh, advantage of the still unused project ideas. So how, when and by whom. And uh, the red color text at the bottom of this picture uh, is are a little bit my critical thoughts when I ask that do we need to store the project ideas at all and why not let them go uh, uh, let them go go away to avoid administrative burden and possibly to avoid the inherent mental burden so which would impede uh, the comp company individuals creativity so it, it is really a kind of a, a difficult thing to kind of a start uh, going through the, the databases and uh, uh, developing the ideas further when they are in a rather explicit documented format and so on. So uh, would it be even more effective to have a new idea campaign and uh, have a fresh ideas with, without uh, that kind of a documented material and so on. Um, or some other way, so if we can have a way of uh, uh, picking those ideas or selecting from those rich number of ideas and uh, doing it worthwhile, so why not then? But uh, I can see that it is a little bit of a problem also, that it kind of may kill the creativity and uh, uh, put some burden to the company to have this kind of a mass of information, mass of ideas. Okay. Let's talk about uh, uh, projects as options. And uh, first let's uh, have this kind of a notion that uh, the more uncertainty there is ahead or uh, uncertainty about the future or we can say that the more different futures there are ahead the more options are worth. So for example uh, if we are thinking about technology development and we don't know which technology becomes uh, dominant in the market that would uh, determine uh, which technology we would use in our product. So uh, maybe we should start two or three different uh, new product development projects which all use different technologies. Those different potential future technologies and whichever technology uh, uh, happens to uh, become the dominant one, then we have been already uh, uh, prepared for that because we have both the options for each of those technology and projects are the options that we have invested in to kind of uh, be prepared for whatever future would come true. Or uh, if we have a big market un uncertainty we could uh, uh, initiate different uh, products to different market segments to scout the markets and in this way learn and uh, in that way to kind of uh, have projects as options that scout markets and then we would select one when we know and that was a kind of a worthwhile option uh, that finally realized in uh, uh, good uh, profit or value and uh, the other ones were options that uh, didn't uh, realize the actual value. They were maybe uh, uh, abandoned or, 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 or killed or, or something. Okay, uh, but the analogy here uh, that I want to uh, talk about this is this uh, tomato garden model. So uh, tomatoes or uh, regions of toma in tomato gardens they are uh, kind of analogous to projects. So we can invest in projects as options or we can invest in uh, 
uh, the kind of a, a tomato garden region uh, as an option. Okay, now I have the word invest uh, in two meanings. In this particular picture, if we look at uh, the top row here, where we have region 6, rotten tomatoes, invest never. So invest here in this particular cell, it refers to taking the tomatoes uh, to the kind of a uh, 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 market or or uh, stock seller or uh, grocery and uh, get profit out of, out of them. And then the region one, ripe tomatoes, invest now. Investing here in these particular cell, the cells, they mean that we take the tomatoes and uh, we get profit from uh, them. Okay. Uh, if we look at, for example, um, uh, the region 4 at the uh, uh, left bottom part of this uh, picture, there are less promising green tomatoes. And uh, the decision with this region is, with this kind of a project is, maybe later. And we, when we make this kind of a decision that maybe later, of course, we must water the tomatoes. We must maybe put uh, some resourcing of uh, taking care of that region and so on. So it costs money anyways. And when we keep that project alive and when we kind of uh, try to uh, foster uh, this region number four. Uh, the status of the region number four may, may change uh, to region number three. So we might move to region number three and those tomatoes can be inedible, but very promising tomatoes. And then the decision is connected to the kind of a, uh, idea that probably later. And again, we must do something. We must continue watering the uh, region and, and, and put some other resources in, 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 in that region and so on. And if everything goes well, uh, we move into region number two status where we have imperfect but edible tomatoes. So it can be maybe now, we can even maybe now take them to grocery or the, to the market uh, and in a way do the final investing, investing or then still wait uh, if the region uh, 2 develops into region 1. But when we started at uh, region number 4, we could also uh, kind of uh, evolve to other direction. Uh, region 4 uh, tomatoes might turn into region 5 status uh, tomatoes. So late blossoms and small green tomatoes, where the decision is connected to the thinking that Probably never. So probably we can uh, not start coming back to uh, something that is really uh, kind of a favorable uh, for us. And, and maybe we are just uh, going to, uh, uh, towards region 6. And maybe uh, this decision might be connected that we don't even want to put watering anymore into uh, that region and so on. So these regions are a kind of a options like uh, uh, projects can be considered as uh, options uh, uh, really uh, and uh, uh, I'm moving here as, as I already kind of uh, now change the picture uh, to this uh, next uh, slide uh, which uh, says that what do we do with an on uh, with on hold projects? So, uh, when we have projects that are on hold, actually the tomato garden uh, uh, regions are not necessarily on hold projects, but they are somehow taken care of continuously, or then decisions are make, made of not taking care of. But still, the on hold projects don't have very clear status 
but they might have a little bit ambiguous status of whether we should continue or not and when we should uh, take the decision of taking them further or kill them for good or, or something like that. And uh, the question is that how a firm can keep an on-hold uh, on -hold project uh, continuously with indecision analysis and decision making. So how can we follow these kind of a latent uh, status uh, type of a projects, uh, uh, for example, in portfolio board meetings and keeping them within our decision making. And the analogy is in the uh, tomato garden model. So uh, uh, there is a continuous follow up analysis and decision making and also uh, uh, leaving a project uh, to be in an on hold state is also a decision of its own. So decisions are not clear that yes, increase the resources, uh, take this project forward or kill this project, but they are this kind of a uh, maybe, possibly and so on decisions that uh, uh, keep the projects uh, with along in the decision making scheme. Okay, uh, hey, um, finally uh, I'm going to talk about uh, project management offices and why I'm taking this uh, theme about project management offices up. First, project management offices can be such bodies in organizations which are responsible for keeping uh, the project information in certain databases, preparing for project portfolio meetings uh, and maybe even making the portfolio decisions uh, themselves. So this picture shows an organizational hierarchy where we have project management offices at two different levels. So maybe a business unit level, maybe a uh, departmental level. And the projects are marked with uh, green arrows at the bottom of this uh, organizational hierarchy. But there are a few projects that are uh, higher level strategic projects that are maybe uh, uh, initiated by the, even the top executives and uh, they uh, are kind of umbrella projects for the whole uh, firm. And uh, then there are these uh, project portfolio boards which are kind of a boards for the line organizations and, uh, and, and, and managers and executives uh, de decisions in the line organization. And normally and many times the project management office in many uh, firms is a kind of a, this kind of a uh, staff function uh, which is not uh, a kind of a responsible line uh, function but uh, more or less a kind of a supportive organizational unit that supports execution of projects or ma management of projects or their portfolios. Okay, uh, project management office, uh, that concept is relatively new. There is no clear definition. And the third item here says that many PMOs serve in the role of supporting, coordinating and controlling the project related work. The fourth one says that the age of project management office could be only a few years. Sometimes project management offices are established just to support uh, the initiation of project management practice in firm, firms. And when we have the practice going on uh, successfully, so there is no need for such a support organization anymore. But also in many organizations, they are very permanent units that uh, take care of project related activities or support project related activities. Uh, the fifth item uh, lists five different groups of functions uh, for P PMO. These functions are derived from uh, literature. And uh, the 
green box at the bottom again says that uh, the PMOs mostly support project execution, so execution of projects. And the very last notion in the green box says that uh, PMOs, PMOs uh, may be connected also to managing portfolios or support portfolios and their management and thereby they might be focusing also in the uh, uh, very early phase of projects, front end of projects, so man managing the creation and development of early project ideas even. In the next picture, when we take these five groups of functions for the PMO, so uh, we have listed here under these five groups of functions A, B, C, D and E some uh, examples of what uh, in a concrete way these uh, PMOs uh, could be under these uh, broad uh, functions uh, of five functions. And you can see that there can be lesson, lessons learned uh, uh, workshops or lessons learned uh, databases. There might be some uh, uh, support to project managers, development of project management methods, even a kind of a uh, training of people which uh, connects some, in some way to human resources management uh, activities and then uh, in the very last uh, uh, kind of a category we have this portfolio uh, data uh, maintaining portfolio ma uh, data, making portfolio decisions and making preparations for project portfolio board meetings. Having said this, however, that uh, PMOs are mostly supportive functions, I want with this picture I would, I would like to take another view. It even can be that a pro PMO in some organizations uh, can be project manager's own organizational unit or home base. So a kind, it even can be a virtual PMO. So this first bullet, this first item uh, of being an own organizational unit or home base, uh, it can be an organization unit where the project managers come back in between uh, their projects. When they don't have projects, they come back to this their own organization unit. They can support other project managers from there or when they are there in their unit, they can develop uh, project management practices and management approaches for the whole organization uh, while not directly working uh, in the next uh, project, uh, not being assigned in the next project. Then uh, another uh, at the lower part of item at the lower part of this picture is the project managers meetings, seminars uh, and social community related actions. So there could be for example monthly meetings among the project managers where statuses of the projects are discussed and uh, some learning issues, lessons learned could be exchanged. This might be more worthwhile and more effective than having the lessons learned uh, workshops at the end of the projects. If we do that on a monthly basis, then every project manager, each and every project management also uh, remembers those uh, cases which were close to happen, uh, unf uh, unfavorable uh, things, events, risks or something and share to others. If we only would have these lessons learned uh, workshops at the end of the project so that uh, uh, workshop or seminar would be a little bit uh, ceremonial and uh, everyone would be exhausted and happy of having the project completed and that is not necessarily uh, a place to uh, exchange lessons learned that can be even too late, people don't even remember important things which happened along the way in the project. So this kind of organi organic way of 
project managers meeting regularly might be a, a, a even a better idea. Then uh, there could uh, some uh, bigger seminars, for example, three times a year or something else, and uh, other kinds of peer-to-peer -peer activity among the project managers. Then there is this uh, concept of community of practice, which refers to the community of project managers and maybe something that was already said in this picture. Uh, regarding this community of practice, so uh, uh, community of practice uh, refers uh, to a group of people, in this case project managers, that uh, share a kind of a, some uh, practical issue. They are passionate about something uh, about what they do, like managing projects. They are committed. Normally the community of practice uh, uh, means that, that there is a shared passion, commitment, learning and sharing. And uh, the membership of this uh, community of practice uh, is connected to uh, competencies and capabilities and also sharing uh, the responsibilities. Um, it is a learning community. And in that way, this even can be a kind of a virtual or semi-virtual uh, community, but this refers to kind of a project manager's community in, in, in a way, as a community of uh, practice, which makes projects and their management and their development and learning in that area meaningful. Well, um, having been talking about the organizational uh, arrangement, uh, PMOs, uh, project portfolio boards, where project portfolio boards are existing bodies, they are existing boards of the organization anyways. Uh, I would still make a notion that if a company is really mature in managing projects, many solution providers are many project-based firms that supply projects uh, and solutions to the customers are, they have so uh, well matured practices within the organization of managing projects in all respects that they don't even need a separate project management office. Not any kind of a support function or any kind of a home base for project managers because the whole organization uh, is tuned to uh, do the projects professionally and all the processes all the training that is organized there, all the method development is an embedded part of the organization already. So the projects and project management and project support and management of the project-based firm is so much embedded into the organization that there is no need for a separate PMO. Then uh, when I showed the picture where there were also projects at the higher level of the organization where I referred that they could be strategic projects uh, initiated by uh, top executives uh, which are umbrellas for the whole organization. So it even can be that top executives can be or a top exec executive can be assigned to uh, be a project manager or project director of such a project. And that would kind of authorize the project uh, very strongly and give a kind of a power also to that uh, uh, project and its execution when there is such a uh, kind of a profiled uh, project uh, director which uh, really is knowledgeable about the business and where the project is aiming at uh, and, and, and what the long-term implications uh, expected from the project are. 
Okay, um, now we are about to step into the last slide. And the title of the last slide uh, will be What did we learn from this lecture? And now we have here the slide. So, um, in project portfolio management we are looking at the collection of the projects. And our locus shifts from single projects to the portfolio and thereby our locus shifts uh, to the management of a firm and its projects as a whole. And this perspective really uh, uh, changes radically our, uh, well, how we see uh, single projects because we don't anymore consider single projects as single entities, but we are looking at uh, uh, the collection of projects and that's why even very profitable projects could be killed and that is not the fault of the project itself. Uh, then uh, the second item, uh, we are talking about projects in the organization of the firm and we were looking at uh, different boards at different levels of the organization and we were looking at the pro project portfolio uh, offices and we were looking very uh, broadly into the firm and its organization. So uh, I again I refer to our textbook and the chapters 5 and 7 uh, where we are talking about the project organization and the firm's organization and projects in there. Then the third item uh, here, project portfolio evaluation and analysis are important. We have certain very useful uh, methods and visualization techniques uh, and we make portfolio decisions. We emphasize that the decisions are portfolio decisions, not decisions uh, uh, about uh, a single project, uh, projects per se. Uh, then the fourth item I want to remind that the projects can renew strategy. So it is not always so that the strategy strategy dictates how the project should be, but it can be that uh, there are emergent strategies and projects uh, 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 give reason to change the firm's strategy. Then we were talking about ideas, options, projects as options, and uh, there were these kinds of uh, very peculiar decisions where we uh, would be based our decision based on uh, notions like maybe later or probably never. And also on hold projects are in a similar uh, manner, uh, similar in the kind of our decision making scheme. So uh, for example, not yet or probably later. We must keep them along uh, as a kind of a very kind of a latent, latent items and uh, we still are not uh, ready to make the final uh, decision about them or final go or final stop or, or something else. Then we were talking about uh, why companies many times uh, they uh, focus on urgent projects and, uh, and not necessarily important or how difficult it is to focus on important projects and it requires a lot from the management to kind of a uh, uh, kind of a raise uh, the status of the important projects and uh, make them also to be implemented. And then there is the paradox of uh, uh, the formal process. So uh, um, the paradox is that uh, in the formal process we can calculate uh, profitability of uh, certain uh, projects and especially the formal process appreciates or takes such projects forward which typically can be calculated for profit or which can be scored uh, for certain criteria which indicate that this is a good project. But the paradox is there that are these projects still a kind of a mediocre or, or, or just moderate uh, uh, 
moder moderate value bringing uh, projects and uh, should we also put atten attention to such projects that are uh, very promising and which can really change the company's future for good and, and, and uh, take the project uh, company to totally different uh, level of business in a good way. But they are so new, they are so wild, they are so ambiguous that we definitely cannot yet uh, calculate any profitabilities in a reliable manner or we can e not even score them and we cannot put them into the formal process because the formal, in the formal process they might be killed because of the ambiguity. And that's why uh, it might be uh, uh, justified that we have these pet projects and under the table projects where we somehow or where the firm and its organization somehow keeps those important things alive which are ambiguous. But still uh, there is a kind of an intuition or understanding or belief, strong belief, expert belief that they are worthwhile and they can really uh, change uh, our future in a good way. Okay, this was uh, what we learned, maybe some other issues as well. So this is the kind of a collection of items in this last slide which I wanted to go through with you. And uh, now in this lecture we have been uh, going through all these uh, items that we uh, kind of looked at uh, in the beginning of this lecture. And uh, I'm happy that uh, we did this and I had the opportunity to uh, discuss these uh, things with you. I hope that you are happy too. So uh, thank you for participating to this uh, lecture and it was nice to spend uh, all this time with you. See you in the future. Thank you and bye.